Okay, so um, this is Kasparov against Lingatink. Let's look at the game in overview and summary. So d4, it was a Queen's Indian opening. Uh, so knight f3 is the Queen's Indian, not not the Nimzo Indian. So knight c3, bishop b4 is Nimzo. Kasparov was avoiding in 1980 the Nimzo Indian by playing knight f3. So after b6, that's a solid continuation, perhaps more solid than say c5. It just aims to sort of increase black's influence on the e4 square. So white finchettoed and black finchettoed the queen's bishop. Uh, now we see knight c3, knight e4. This is all theory. So uh, bishop f6, e4 pressure on d4. So now. Okay, so both sides castled here, and then we saw rook c1. Uh, so rook c1 is 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 a useful general purpose uh, move. After the knight takes, say, then d5, the rook is prepared for any exchanges on c3. Black played c5, so white's well prepared now to play d5, and it leaves him with a pawn which is very handy uh, for blunting out the bishop. And black went for the dark square bishop, as we saw. Knight takes d2, but it gave white this e4 square, which was quite useful for these knights. So d6, knight d e4. And it was difficult now for black to just develop this knight naturally. A move like, because of this d6 pawn, a move like knight a6, you know, might allow actually, that there might be knight b5s as well on the cards to sort of bully that pawn on d6 here. So rook e8 for the moment was played. Okay, queen d2, as though f4 is going to be a useful spot for the queen. Let's put more pressure on d6. After a6, that does deprive white of the knight b5 resource. Maybe that's the key purpose, in fact. But now white cleverly uh, peels open the queen side with b4. With the idea, perhaps, that if, if takes on b4, then knight takes f6, then a knight e4, and he'll be regaining that pawn on b4 with advantage, with queenside pressure. And also on b4, the queen would be attacking d6 as well. So black decided here uh, to play bishop e7, and white peels open that b file anyway, which is always good because you know there's a sitting target, there's a b7 bishop on b7 anyway. So it's useful to peel open that uh, b file. So both both sides have that b-file, but look at black's rook quality. White's rooks are already springing into action here. Uh, they're much more active and aggressive in this position. And black's a bit tied down. This bishop in particular is a bit tied uh, down behind the pawn chain here. It looks like a Benoni gone wrong a little bit. But white in this position is not playing for e4, e5 like you would expect in a Benoni. No, he's just sitting on a very comfortable position though, nevertheless. And still d6 in this structure is, is quite weak. So queen f4, putting more pressure on d6, you know, tying, trying to prevent knight d, d7 maybe. So queen c7, and black was really groveling here for a plan. One might think, well, was actually bishop f8 possible instead of queen c7? It probably, um, the, the bishop doesn't seem to be doing much. It would be quite passive on f8. But the game continuation didn't look particularly amazing for black in terms of counterplay uh, generation. There didn't seem to be hardly any counterplay at all, actually, after this, this sequence. Knight a4, threatening to take on c5 because of the pin. So queen a5, now rook b1, very clever move, leaving the knight hanging because of knight f6 to win that queen. So bishop takes d5, and now a very forcing, you know, tactical sequence. Knight b6, forking a rook and bishop, winning the light square bishop, and it looks as though, well, isn't this the end of the worries for a moment anyway? After rook a7, but now this knight c8 is a real stunner of a move, forking rook and bishop, and if if rook takes c8, then I believe queen f5, just hitting the rook and hitting h7. Uh, is just winning material here. Uh, for example, you know, it will just be like mating if queen takes because of this embarrassing, the bishops getting in the way. So knight c8 is an absolute stunning uh, move here. So winning the exchange and very shortly the game now. 
Explorer is not interested in bishop c6. He can just win the exchange and play now bishop d5. And black's really quite overloaded. If rook f8 in this final position, black resigned. If rook f8, then rook b7. Black's getting really tied down, and and lots of moves will win here. So, okay, I hope you got something from that game. Uh, let's go on to another game uh, from the Olympiad. I'll just load in another game. Okay, so now this game is against the 2490 player, Marjanovic, from U the Yugoslav team uh, here. Um, so in 1980, uh, Sparov was playing for the, US, um, the USSR, and after the split, he was playing for Russia. So 1980 Olympiad, okay, Yugoslav um, player Marjanovic, Slavozrob uh, Marjanovic. So um, D4 again. So d4 was Kasparov's favorite first move, it seems, in this Olympiad. After knight f6, again, we have c4, e6. Very popular choice by his opponents. And again, Kasparov suppresses the Nimzo Indian defense. Uh, he plays, actually, knight f3. So now b6 again, a repeat of, of the previous um, uh, opening, to some extent. But now, actually, after bishop e7, we're, we're deviating from the other game. After both sides castle, we get a very interesting pawn sacrifice here, which might be slightly dubious, uh, but it's it's quite hot still, I think. Uh, it's played, I, I've, I've, I'm pretty sure um, Grandmasters are still playing this. It is dangerous initiative for white, because after e takes d5, white now plays knight h4 and is eyeing that f5 square. Okay, so black is a pawn up. Plays c6, which gives the possibility that maybe uh, black can play this sort of stuff to try and hold on to his d5 pawn. White takes on d5, knight takes d5. Okay, hitting that bishop, uh, that knight on, on h4 rather. The knight comes into a very comfortable attacking square. Sparrow's favourite square, actually, for an attacking knight, whether it's the Roy Lopez or this kind of variation. A knight on f5 is very dangerous. Okay, so knight c7 is played here. As though black wants to play d5, actually. Okay, in this position, now we have knight c3, d5 is allowed, permitted here. And now white immediately challenges um, that d5 pawn by playing e4. So we could end up with two beautifully, um, well, if d takes, there could be big trouble for black here. If we have a look at this position. Uh, first of all, I mean, white might consider queen takes, and then maybe knight d6 is painful to regain, the, maybe the regaining the pawn with some advantage soon. But there might be even stronger here. Uh, in the game, let's try and work this out. Black played bishop f6. Uh, but what would happen if d takes e4? Uh, do any of you, if you, if I give you 20 seconds to have a look at this position, uh, what what would be your idea here uh, with the white pieces? Is there, there isn't a forced win, or is there? It's, I think it's just comfortable for white, but someone might correct me if I give you 20 seconds to have a look at this position. Anyone? Ah, oh, actually, that's looking like a force win. One of the suggestions. <laughs> Very good. Okay, one of the suggestions come in from Twitch um, live stream uh, from someone. Uh, another one which looks like a force win as well potentially. <laughs> All right, there's two which look pretty dangerous. Two really dangerous forcing moves here have been mentioned. Knight h6 check. I wonder if we can rule that out. Can we rule out knight h6 check? If takes, what would be the follow-up here? Queen g4, or bishop, queen g4. Say king h8. This could be dangerous because of bishop e4, I guess. Because now, actually, queen f5. 
But I wonder, Black would have a few defensive resources here, surely. One would be to sacrifice the exchange with f5. Or just play rook g8. Because, uh, you know, uh, I'm not sure this is sound. So I don't, I'm not convinced with knight h6 check, unless anyone can make this work. I don't think knight h6 works. I just explained. Someone mentioned knight h6. I'm not sure that works. But let's try queen g4. Queen g4. Is that any better? Maybe just g6. I don't know. This looks still quite dangerous, though. Bishop h6, maybe. Um, is this is this convincing? This queen g4, or is there a better? Just just let's get this position again. So d takes e4 wasn't played in the game. Uh, Bishop f6 was played. Uh, so what would be good here for white? Um, I do wonder if just the simple... Um, maybe, maybe just knight takes e4, you know. Is, is okay because if if queen takes d1 you've always got knight e7 check as a Zwishan zone and now actually you might have threats like knight d6 you know attacking that bishop so okay also oh um bishop takes e4 has been mentioned bishop takes e4 yeah it looks fairly dangerous anyway okay so black in the game played Bishop f6. Now white, Kasparov took on d5. Okay, black played c takes d5. And there's still an attacking initiative. Bishop f4 now supports knight d6, among other things. Uh, so black plays knight b a6. And there's a lot of pressure here. This knight's kind of very useful. Rook e1. And now queen d7 is slightly dubious move here. May may not have been the best because it runs into a potentially dangerous discovered uh, check. Kasparov simply plays here bishop h3 as though you know knight h6. Um, well, is that easily parable? Maybe the opponent thought it was uh, because he played here actually uh, just king h8 as though well he thought maybe no big deal here. This is actually given a, a question mark. Uh, by um, some annotators because white is able to use the pin now on the d pawn white plays a very resourceful attacking move here and threatens uh, to cause structural damage uh, with this next move um, can you guess what white played here so a very very nice uh, positional attacking move now so if I give you 10 seconds, try and hide the, the move score if you're on the play chess server, please, for these guess the moves to make them a bit harder. Um, so 10 seconds starting from now. Okay. All right, let's, I'll just show you it. So knight e4. So using that pin and threatening knight takes f6 structural damage. So offering b2 though, so what's going on here? The dynamics of the white position is increasing and increasing here now. Because actually um, a kind of weakness of the last move with bishop takes b2. The bishop's not guarding g5 at the moment now. Spoff exploits that, knight g5. And he's now threatening menacing things like queen h5. So these knights all of a sudden... Uh, the knight on f5 was bad enough, but now we've got uh, a friend on g5. And these knights are looking like pretty serious uh, stuff. All of these pawns uh, are being attacked by the knights. And queen h5 is on the cards. Okay, and taking here doesn't seem the, the, the cleverest idea. Uh, because, well, maybe just queen h5 is actually the strongest rather than takes. Because maybe f6 if takes. Maybe f6 here will blunt the queen but actually it looks as though um, if bishop takes a1 it looks as though queen h5 is fairly crushing 
uh, because h6 you just blast this away I think but uh, let's look at the game continuation black tried to defend with queen c6 uh, which looks fairly miserable it might have some advantage of being able to play h6 supported by the queen as a defensive measure but um, the queen is just attacked with knight e7 and now actually brilliant stuff occurs now after queen f6 another mega forcing move um, which can be deadly in many games just simply f forcing uh, moves are, are, are the top priority to consider usually um, if you're going to do calculations but a very very forcing move again is played here by white um, I wonder if you can guess it uh, if I give you 10 seconds here anyone okay I'll show you knight takes h7 just attacking the queen and this knight is stopping any king g8 so this is pretty embarrassing if if king takes then check what do you do here king's got no escape so you'd have to give up your queen so uh, knight takes h7 is a bit of a painful shot so the queen has to move basically it goes queen d4 and now the queen comes in for the kill magnificent stuff because Borov has turned this kind of d4 opening into a real hack attack system with this pawn sacrifice so horrible threats immediately threatening knight f6 just mating on the spot uh, off the g6 white doesn't have to do anything that clever here he doesn't have to uh, leave his queen in pre or do anything magical he just plays queen h4 he's still have this horrible threat of, of queen h6 sorry knight f6 uh, which is executed now after bishop takes a1 knight f6 and okay uh, black resigns here uh, because it's, it looks like a forced mate actually the queen is supporting that f6 so if king g7 um, I wonder if you can see what white could play here. It looks like a mate in two puzzle now. A very simple mate in two puzzle. So I wonder if I give you 10 seconds, can you spot what white plays here to mate black? Actually, it's not quite mate in two. What am I talking about? This queen has got influence on h4, so it's not, not that simple. Um, And it might not actually be bishop h6 coming to think about it there's another very strong powerful move in this position which which i can see which it might be actually instead of bishop h6 if if we follow bishop h6 the thing is what do we do after this is this actually mating because if you if you play bishop takes then queen takes h4 uh, but it so what do you guys vote if i give you two choices to vote for um or there's three you've got queen h6 bishop h6 all what i've spotted myself is knight f5 looks mightily attractive uh to force g takes uh, unless it's a queen sack my personal favorite is knight f5 what do you guys vote um if if i give you 10 seconds i think knight f5 is the most clear cut mind you the smoking gun makes a good point that queen h6 looks pretty <laughs> clear cut <laughs> Queen h6 is pretty clear cut as well. Probably there's many ways to win this. <laughs> Actually, um, <laughs> all right, it's been pointed out a very, very clear cut continuation. Let's just go with that. Queen h6 is actually just mating, actually, because king takes, we have bishop g5 splat, it's mate. Very good. Well done, Spoken Gun <laughs> on Twitch. That is pretty clear cut okay so knight f5 is not necessary um although it, it looks pretty good as well actually this this looks pretty clear cut as well just mating in another way isn't it but queen h6 is pretty fast yeah okay so the only one that, that doesn't probably win is bishop h6 or does that win as well maybe that wins as well is there a win here as well probably may, maybe not okay not needed anyway 
So let's let's have a look in overview and summary of of this game. Uh, so so did you all get knight f5 was winning as well? There's there's many ways to win this now. There's so many attacking things about this position after this check. So knight f5. See where where else was the king going? Can't go anywhere. So it has to take then queen g5 is is mate. So that that one as well. And there was also the queen h6 as pointed out. Okay, so we had a totally one position. So let's rewind, find out how this happened. How did white get such a vicious attack going against the black king from the queen's engine? Now this pawn sacrifice definitely, I think at least Danny Gormani in the British Championship recently has, has played this queen's engine pawn sack. I think it's fairly standard. So basically, after castles, to play d5, so maybe you, you might think, well, perhaps black should have played d5 if he wants to be solid to avoid this uh, pawn sack. Uh, maybe Chess Explain knows about this. Is d5 played now? Because this d5 from white did seem to be very, very aggressive. Uh, just springing d5 as a pawn sacrifice. Because uh, getting this knight, undermining that control of f5, installing that first knight here, is a very aggressive idea indeed, it seems. Uh, so knight h4 to get the knight to f5. Um, okay, at the cost of a pawn. So the funny thing is, this knight is destined to join as a friend on g5. How on earth did this knight get over here? So it's a bit like this. And then we've got the makings of a menacing attack if the queen can get involved in principle but how did that that happen again d5 e4 after bishop f6 we saw taking on d5 we saw bishop f4 as though knight d6 was a positional threat after knight b a6 rook e1 gave white uh, well black went slightly wrong here after queen d7 it seems in retrospect we're all grandmasters in retrospect but uh, allowing this forcing move uh, bishop h3 the the weakness of the diagonal is not exploitable at the moment for black that needs a lot of time to get anything arranged on this uh, but for the moment he's more concerned about knight h6 check uh, than anything else um he plays king h8 and now knight e4 is sprung on him and the knights just install themselves we've got two beautiful attacking knights with the queen potentially coming to h5 it's a dream kind of attacking position uh, one considers that one is told in the royal Lopez Kasparov um, uh, likes the knight on f5 but uh, to extend the dream now we see from this game that actually to make that even worse get a knight to g5 as well get a queen to h5 and it should be all over there should be lots of uh, mating opportunities as this game shows so 97 getting stopping black from the crude counter-attack plan well actually not here here uh, disrupting very very quick just very very quick knight takes h7 and it's just it's just all over so a real crunch uh, I am Chess Explain Lights. Black needs to know his stuff, but in 1980, this was brand new. This was brand new stuff. Because um, Ralph was behind, by the way, um, Chess Base. Um, he was one of the early supporters of Chess Base. And maybe, you know, he had a lot of novelties with the help of Dave's bases worked out. This seems to be, you know, a brilliant concept, this pawn sacrifice, still used today with great effects, I think. Um, and people know a lot more theory now for how to refute these things. But at the time, how devastating this innovation and this whole you know concept must have been. He's made two very strong players look very passive and not given them a shred of counterplay. Uh, you can say from uh, Karpov games when because when Karpov was at his peak, that Karpov uh, restricted counterplay. But Kasparov restricted counterplay in his own way. He made the opponents so passive and without any sort of fighting chance so you know what can you say about this it's a walk over this game but let's have a look at another game from this olympiad on oh, 1987 chess base was 1987 
Well, I think he was he was one of uh, the early people involved in that. So it was before chess base. Okay. Okay. So um. All right. So Kasparov against Nazis. So this is the Greek team now. Now Nazis, unfortunately, was only twenty two forty. Um, unfortunately, the Greek team didn't seem that strong in 1980. Um, if they've got a 2240 playing for them on the team, um, a, lo a lot of the Olympiad teams are nowadays, um, well, apart from the weaker countries, they, they usually have teams filled with GMs now. Probably there's a lot more GMs nowadays than back in 1980. So he's outrating his opponent by, by over 300 points here. So let's see how this went. He played D4. And that's this. I hate. I'm not trying to make this a joke, by the way. But can you guess what that's his, that's his, his first name? Is remarkably like mine. And no, it wasn't me. That's his, his first name is Trifon. T R I F O N. Actually, my name is T R Y F O N. Um, now, Trifon in Greek. <clears throat> just while on the subject, is is three sounds Trifon us. I wonder if if it was based on that as well there's a St Trifon's day but let's get back to the game so this is Dr Drifon Nazis <laughs> okay <laughs> oh dear so knight f6 uh, c4 g6 daring to play either a, a king's engine or a groom field so what what is it going to be a king's engine or a groom field um, knight c3 now I don't know to play the king's engine seems more dangerous sometimes so anyway the opponent played d5 unless you really really know your stuff the the groom field um defense was used uh by black in this game and Kasparov just took on d5 very topical he went like main line uh, so e4 and now bishop g7 this is all theory knight f3 black strikes in the center with c5 Okay, now we see in this game actually h rook b1 uh, variation. So kind of using that b5 immediately, tying the bishop a bit to b7. Okay, because black sometimes wants to exert more pressure on d4 with moves like this. So rook b1 is a bit of an inhibitor move. Uh, black castle, bishop e2. And now this is played in really dynamic, exciting fashion, actually, after knight c6. Because sometimes you might be put off playing uh, the Groomfield from the white side. Because it feels as though you're being a, a nurse nanny for your pawn center. That's how sometimes I, I think on the white side of the Groomfield. Do I have to really take care of the center? I think Karpov was one of the greatest players on the white side of the groom field because he somehow managed to stop people even Gasparov getting too much counterplay uh, but white is not nurse standing his center in this game he plays actually d5 offering up c3 uh, to get a dangerous initiative and black actually takes this uh, if he doesn't then he's just giving white you know a huge center isn't he if he doesn't take on c3 here what is he going to do? Is he going to move the knight? Surely not to here, because I don't know. This looks terrible. You know, maybe c4, maybe maybe the, the b6. But this center looks too strong. So black uh, takes on c3. So yet another player in this Olympiad giving Gaspar a seemingly strong, dynamic, attacking uh, position to start from. So. Kasparov is always the one down in material, but with the huge dynamism. So another pawn sacrifice. Um, it was a hallmark of many Alakine uh, games to sack a pawn for dangerous uh, initiative. Uh, I am Chess Explain writes, Knight e5 is normal, maybe about equal. Okay, so I think this bishop c3 looks a bit dangerous, doesn't it? Uh, Chess Explain? Looks a bit dangerous, doesn't it? Um, so bishop d2 this this looks like a dangerous pawn sacrifice and now actually white's center looks quite strong black gives back the pawn um, but um, it looks as though white's got a slight advantage here in the end game uh, because the rooks are kind of more active and Spoff is not afraid actually to get the queens off after check um, well there's not much else if he doesn't want to lose a pawn for, 
maybe that pawn is not sound you know and leaving he can't do this he puts the queen in the way okay queens come off now rook d8 so he's got a, an advantage because the rooks can can put real pressure on the queen side here quite quickly <clears throat> the king is actually quite <clears throat> useful I think I'm going to have some Diet Coke for a minute. Have a look at this position. Do you prefer white here? Do you think it's a clear advantage for white? If I give you 20 seconds, what's your evaluation here? Uh, who prefers white here? So 20 seconds evaluation Why I sip some Diet Coke. <clears throat> okay um i'm just explained reckons this is terrible for black white's better someone's i'm i may fill it i'm going gun advantage for white um dante two or two kings very close together soon um oh vekunda you're going against the flow you reckon black <laughs> No, no, no. Black is is doing badly because King E three now, and you know E six is is not a major threat, is it now? So this rook's immediately you know and threatening an invasion on the seventh. Uh, also, this bishop's ready if needed across this diagonal. Um, and what to do about this bishop uh, developing? Black tries to play B six maybe to develop the bishop somewhere or something, but this is awful now. This this C seven is a real pain point for black black tries to still undermine the center but it's not very groomfield ish i'm afraid for black black simply supports d5 with bishop c4 and now instead of wanting to install a horrendous bishop on d5 this looks unpalatable this position doesn't it because f7 will be a major target it looks totally unpalatable and a7 you can't allow this so black just conceded here defeat in the center by playing e5 at least you know the bishop's blocked by its own pawn i guess but it's it's not pleasant bishop b3 and again renewing the threat now of just rook c7 which now comes with powerful effect so rook c7 he can at leisure just recharge that rook with rooks it support it um but also this pawn can now be unmasked unmasking the bishop soon Sorry, that sounds a bit naughty. Sorry, I don't mean to. Sorry, anyway, a5, um, d6. <laughs> Sorry, uh, the bishop now. Um, bishop, if bishop e6. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so uh, b5 is played. Okay, so black's trying to use the two to one uh, pawn majority. Okay. Now. Uh, the center is a bit mobile here though isn't it if this pawn can be knocked out then e5 is going to be a dangerous threat so we've got the the two to one here and we've got the center uh, potentially uh, mobile so f4 is played it's difficult with this pawn pin to do anything about this okay so e takes f4 king takes f4 now with the positional threat just e5 the center is getting swamped here what can black do about this impeding disaster here in the center so rook a6 e5 supporting the pawn and if the king gets out of the way we've also got another potential attacking point f7 just with the rook here so the rook's not yet committed but also maybe just support uh, e6 like this it look, all looks pretty crushing in the center a4 bishop d5 a3 